Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to this session. My name is uh, Pierre Guillemin. I'm a PhD student in uh, theoretical physics, and I'm working with a French startup called uh, Alice and Bob, whose aim is to build a quantum computer. Today, I'm very excited to tell you why PyTorch is well suited to simulate quantum systems. And I'll uh, start with a, a little bit of history. Uh, I think it's nice to go back to the end of the 19th century and to recall the state of mind of physicists at this time. So there is this quote by Michelson who said, the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered. And this really reflects the state of mind uh, of physicists back then. They thought that the main foundations of science were solved, were found, and that there were no, new, no big news ahead of them. And as you know, it turns out they were wrong. The 20th century featured two major revolutions in physics. The first one being general relativity, which uh, reshaped the way we think about the fabric of space and time. Um, but this is a story for another day. And the second revolution was uh, quantum physics. Quantum physics describes the behavior of matter at very small scales, at the scales of atoms and molecules. And it's really a completely different world with uh, new rules and exotic phenomenon. And uh, so people realized at the end of the 20th century that if we want to simulate nature, we need to simulate quantum physics. And to simulate quantum physics, we won't be able to use the classical computer we have. So Richard Feynman, who was a famous physicist uh, from uh, this time, said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. This is how the idea of uh, quantum computers and quantum computing was born. The idea that we need a new machine if we want to simulate nature. Now, what is it that makes it hard to simulate quantum systems? On this slide, you have on your left uh, classical mechanics and Newton's second law, which relates how the momentum of a particle evolves with respect to the external forces. And on the right, you have a quantum mechanics and Schrodinger equation, which tells you how the state of the system, psi, evolves with the Hamiltonian, which represents the forces on your system. And as you can see, the mathematical structure is a very similar uh, of the, in these two equations. So they are both ordinary differential equations with respect to time, and they relate how the state, evo the state of the system evolves with the external forces. So this is not what makes quantum mechanics hard to simulate. We've known how to solve a differential equation and to simulate them for a long time. However, if you take uh, n particles, the little black dot here are particles, um, the mathematical structure you need to describe the ensemble of particles in classical mechanics is a direct sum. This means that you can describe the state of each particle independently. Even though they may interact with the sum of forces, you can always identify each particle and describe its state. And as a result, the dimension of the overall system is just the sum of dimension of the subsystems. In quantum mechanics, however, you have a phenomenon which is called entanglement. And to describe this phenomenon, the mathematical structure you need is a tensor product. And as a result, the dimension of the overall system, the number of values you need to keep track, um, scales exponentially with the number of particles. So to give you an order of magnitudes, if you have 60 particles in classical mechanics, you typically have uh, six variables for each particle, three for the position, three for the momentum. So you need to keep track of 360 values. If you have 60 qubits, qubits are the most basic uh, quantum physical system. Uh, there are two level systems. And you want to simulate the system, you need to keep track of two to the power of 60 values, uh, which is roughly 10 to the seven uh, terabytes. And let's suppose you have a machine which is uh, able to store this amount of data. If you add one qubit, if you want to simulate 61 qubit, you need to double the size of the machine to simulate this uh, new added qubit. So this is really the reason why Feynman said we need a, a new machine to simulate uh, quantum physics. We won't be able to simulate it with classical computer just because the size in memory just to store the state uh, is, uh, is huge. That's why people are trying to build a quantum computer, a computer to simulate physics, to simulate nature. And there are many uh, technologies. I'm going to discuss two today. Um, you are, have here a picture of a trapped ion a vacuum chamber. So the gray parts you see in the middle are electrodes, and they create an electromagnetic field, uh, which has a minimum of potential where you can uh, trap an ion. So in this picture, you can see a single ion which was trapped by this uh, potential. And now if you trap multiple ions, and you do operation on single ions, and operation between ions, you can leverage the laws of quantum physics to perform computation. So this is one example of how you could uh, implement, in practice, a quantum computer. Another technology which is uh, widespread uh, is called superconducting circuits. Uh, so this is a chip which is designed by my startup, Alice and Bob, 
and we could have done at a very low temperature, close to absolute zero. And at this uh, low temperature, this uh, chip, they exhibit quantum uh, behavior, and we harness this uh, quantumness to perform quantum computation. Today, there are 350 startups and 180 universities working in quantum technologies. So it's really a thriving field uh, of science and a soon to be thriving field of uh, economy. However, to build this machine, to build this quantum computer, we have a problem. Is that we need to simulate these small quantum systems. We need to simulate these trapped ions and we need to simulate these superconducting chips to be able to calibrate them and to control them. So we are a little bit back to Feynman's problem of uh, simulating uh, quantum systems. So why PyTorch? Why the uh, quantum physicist uh, is coming uh, to at a, well, supposedly machine learning related uh, conference? Um, so the reason is not to have the PyTorch conference sucks, even if they are very cool. The reason is that PyTorch has two main features that are extremely well suited to simulate quantum systems. The first of them is GPU acceleration. Solving this uh, Schrodinger equation I showed you, showed you amounts to multiply very large matrices, matrices with typically million or billion elements, and using specialized hardware to do this um, makes your simulation much faster. And second, we very often run several simulations, so being able to batch them in large sensors to run them simultaneously um, is very advantageous. And second, a lot of tasks related to the calibration and control of uh, quantum systems uh, need you to compute the gradient of the time-evolved quantum states. So in this little scheme, you have uh, some parameters that, and then you evolve the system quantum state in time, and then you compute some, you're going to compute some function, some loss function of this, uh, of this state, and often you want to compute the gradient of this loss function with respect to the input parameters. So you want to differentiate through the quantum solver. And for this, we use a PyTorch uh, automatic differentiation, the Autograd uh, toolbox. And we also have a custom uh, method called the adjunct state method. The reason is that to solve this uh, differential equations, you do a lot of little time steps. And so if you naively do automatic differentiation on the forward path, PyTorch is going to be this a huge graph of operation, which is going to be very costly in memory, uh, because typically you do 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 time steps. So the adjunct state method is a constant memory cost method, uh, which uh, permits, allows you to compute the gradient, and roughly the idea is to solve a, an augmented equation in imaginary time, backward in time, which will give you the gradient. So maybe you know about this paper from a NeurIPS conference 2018 called Neural Ordinary Differential Equations, where they propose to replace um, the neural network by an ordinary differential equation, and they use this adjunct uh, state method to compute the gradient. Now I think it's nice to see that the PyTorch was first designed to train large neural networks, uh, but it turns out the main building blocks, being able to run on a different and specialized hardware and being able to run fast and uh, precise automatic differentiation are actually extremely well suited for the quantum community and to simulate uh, quantum systems. And that's why today I'm happy to announce the Dynamics library, uh, which is an open source Python library. It's available on uh, GitHub for GPU accelerated and differentiable quantum simulations. So it works for both closed and open quantum system. You just give your Hamiltonian or jump operators, um, and we run the simulation leveraging PyTorch on GPU, and you can also compute the gradient with respect to the final quantum state. So the way we built it is that we implemented quantum solvers directly in PyTorch, and it's been developed by both physicists and developers, uh, and it's sponsored by my uh, startup uh, called uh, Alice and Bob. So the name is uh, Dynamics with a, with a Q. No, I also came to you today because we have some uh, specific needs for quantum system simulation. Uh, and the first one is complex support. Nature dictates to us that we need to use complex numbers to, uh, um, to simulate it. Um, and so it would be amazing to see complex support in torch.compile or on MPS devices. A second feature which uh, would be really nice is the support for sparse matrices. So the Hamiltonian I told you about, uh, it represents physical interaction, so it has structure. And uh, namely, it's uh, often very sparse. Um, and finally, uh, we'd love to see some uh, more support for some linear algebra operation. Uh, an example, for example, is to uh, apply the exponential of a matrix to a vector directly. All right, so to summarize, uh, as Feynman said, we need a new machine if we want to simulate nature. And this machine must be a quantum computer, a computer that is made of tiny quantum physical systems. And to simulate this machine, to build this machine, we need to simulate these uh, tiny uh, quantum physical systems. And for this, we propose the Dynamics Library. 
So hopefully one day we will be able to achieve Feynman's dream of a simulated nature, and maybe PyTorch will have a help us uh, along the way. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, sure. So the um, MIT labs, they did a project uh, called uh, Torch Quantum, which is also open source. So what they do is mostly circuit simulation, which means they take idealized qubits, um, quantum bits, and then they run uh, some circuits, so some gates on these qubits. What we propose here is really to uh, go lower in the stack and to do physical simulations. So if you want to do, if you want a little higher level, I suppose you already have working qubits and you um, simulate circuits on them, we propose to go a little lower and simulate the physics of the different qubits. Thank you for your question. Yes. That's also a very good question. Uh, so typically, the matrices, uh, the Hamiltonian, is a, a smart, smart matrices matrix, sorry, with dense diagonals. So you have a few dense diagonals, um, and it's not a sparse format, which is well supported, and uh, typically on PyTorch and or on uh, other. Uh, of the libraries. Yes. So the reason is uh, most of us are working on Macs, so it would be amazing to run the simulations on our directly on our devices. Um, right. So I think yeah. I think the complex support for Metal was just like very newly released, uh, like a month or two months ago. So hopefully it will come soon to PyTorch as well. Thank you.